I've never made a film before, but if I did, I'd make a good one. Or a really good one. But nowadays, streaming shows are just as popular, or even more so, than big pictures. With impressive budgets bringing stunning visuals to life. YouTube have also jumped on this with their YouTube originals. That was the joke! Usually where they take a safe and brand-friendly person and give them their own show. Some of these are great, some are blacklisted, <laughs> and then we have Liza Koshy's show, Liza On Demand. And she won't buy me those Yeezys. I can't believe you would sleep with a black horse. The show stars Liza playing herself on various Class A substances, so basically normal Liza. <laughs> Accompanied by her friends, Harlow and Oliver, Liza travels around LA completing various odd jobs for the Tasket app, seeing what wacky and quirky hijinks they get into. I'm going down. I covered the first season of her show in a previous video, but now it's been renewed for a second season with even more episodes. You can tell people really wanted a second season. Look at all the glowing reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. The opening episode has uh, 81 million views. It's time to simp. And by the dislike ratio, it's obvious people went to Liza's channel to get this content, and it definitely wasn't artificially dumped in their recommended. The first episode opens with Liza talking about how Tasket have changed since the first season. What's up with the internet? I can't log on to Tasket. I thought as an elite status tasker you got your pick of the jobs. I told you, Tasket got bought. Okay, there's no status of any kind now. It's a goddamn free-for-all. Now, if you guys didn't know, the first season of Liza on Demand, Liza's end goal was to get the coveted elite status on Tasket. Basically meaning she'd get a bunch of cool benefits. <laughs> the very end of the first season, she gets the status. And now the beginning of the second season, it's been defunct to nothing. I watched over three hours of Liza Koshy just to end up back where I started. The flow of time itself is convoluted, with heroes centuries old phasing in and out. Liza also explains how she set herself up on a dating app and has no matches until she augments her breasts, and then she gets instantly matched. I haven't gotten one response on my profile. Not one! But last night, I took some new photos wearing these. And guess what? But I, I got a date. That's right, I'm going on a date later. Listen, my systems are acting up a little, so I've got to get checked out. Kind of ironic how the last season's message was mostly, look how bad this man is, how he treats woman, that's bad. Now I'm sad. But this time, Liza is basically lying to a man to get a date. But, you know, uh, they, they also make a, a Karen speaking to the manager joke. What is Office Topia? Uh, um, only the hottest Instagram installation. Oh, and I hear that there's this woman named Karen who just sits there and complains that the AC is too hot. Guys, we can no longer make the Karen speaking to the manager joke. Rest in peace, it had a good run. Liza also gets a job modeling before a date, thinking she'll show off to everyone, but she has to strip n n I'm, I'm sorry, I- Hey, text-to-speech bot, can you say the word for me? No, Susan will rob us. Thank you. Also in the B story, Oliver is pretending to be a straight man to lure out a married man who he thinks may be gay. I may have pretended to be married and let him lure me out of the closet. I thought it was gonna be a one-time thing, but we're kind of vibing. I mean, to, to be fair, it, it's more complex than a Rick and Morty B story, so I'll give him that. In the art class, Liza bottles it and runs outside the fire exit, trapping her dressing gown in the doorway. They basically nabbed the scene from Birdman, except where that was an amazing, chaotic, constant take. This is quirky humor where a woman runs down the street, hiding beyond various objects. Liza then tries to nab a jacket from a thrift shop, only to get caught by the owner. Stop! Thief! Put that back, you worthless thief. I love the fact that she can commit theft so nonchalantly, but she can't exit out of dialogue with someone. She gets given a paper bag to wear by the shop owner and has to walk back to the art house in shame. Call the fanning one the same one. This scene pretty much explains the whole show perfectly. Notice how Liza is engaging with these people despite them giving her no attention whatsoever. I mean, to be fair, it is LA. They probably thought she was like an anti-plastic campaign or something. But oh no, guys. Liza's date sees her in the paper bag. What an inconvenience. The shot ends like there's gonna be a commercial break or something. Liza, quite panicked, runs into a Botox clinic that uses bees. Because that's funny. I mean, what's the deal with cancer? 
She knocks open a beehive and wow, look, that's 80% of the season's budget gone to one CGI bee. Take that, Marvel. We have a bee. Get that beta wasp out of here. One thing I've noticed watching this season as well, only one episode in and most of Liza's comedy Bazinga. pretty much just comes from her pulling a facial expression like she took five milligrams of fentanyl. Practical comedy is great, but if you're just pulling the same smooth brain face every time, it gets super repetitive. Man. Also, because this is Liza's show, one thing she loves to do is use it as a platform to mock people she doesn't agree with. Like how this caricature of a woman berates Liza for wearing a poster of a plus-size girl because she's not happy about her figure. Where did you get that? What? That poster. You need to give it to me. No, I have been all over town tearing those awful things down. They are extremely offensive. What's wrong with her? I have spent years starving myself, and now they're just gonna put someone like that on the cover, huh? This has all just been for nothing? Yes, because every lean woman has starved themselves to get where they are today with their body. But you know what? I'll give it this. At least it's woman bad this time instead of man bad. Liza's slowly getting more diverse. Is that... Whoa, Jack! She finally gets her clothes. I mean, it, it, it's not gonna matter. The video's gonna get demonetized anyway. She learns literally nothing from the experience and uses coconuts to augment her breasts. I'm engineered, so what? My brother and I suspected as much while we were growing up. Also, she finally meets a date and the coconuts fall out in under five seconds, making the entire bit pointless. How did tropical fruit get in my shirt? What? She then gives a speech about how she's finally happy with herself and her body, not letting anyone judge her. Incredibly entitled, as to most standards, Liza is very conventionally attractive. Liza then, of course, strips off, and she wrote into the script that a horde of people would surround her, taking pictures in awe. We've truly entered Lele Pond's level in lack of self-awareness. No, you got this, you got this. What are you doing? Lele, what the... <laughs> Nice, bro. Also, Liza's day is bold and nearly blind. Because there's five minutes of runtime left, we can't find any proper character flaws that aren't superficial. But then again, the writers needed to get rid of him without Liza coming across as a total narcissist. So they came up with this excuse. Hey, what are you doing home so early? Well, Tyler came out about being bald, being blind, but managed to leave out the part about being married. What? Yeah, we went back to his place and there were pictures of his wife everywhere. Apparently she was out of town for the weekend. Liza Koshi won, men zero. Oh yeah, and that B story with Oliver dating the other guy, that didn't work out, but who really cares? We knew it wouldn't have worked out because that would mean the writers would have had to accommodate future episodes for him. And that requires effort. Your wife is a lovely, lovely person and she's crazy about you. I got to know her when I- Two, two, two. Two. Mom, no, I haven't ordered my sari yet. The opening of episode two, Liza's trying to fix her broken car, and the car becomes sentient, probably trying to escape the show. The theme around this episode is family. Huh? Yeah, that one. And Liza doesn't want to go to a family reunion because she finds them boring. I mean, would anybody really notice if I didn't go? Maybe your weird uncle who kisses you on the mouth. Uncle Rush. Wow, I didn't know Greg Paul got a cameo in this series. Thanks, Liza. How inclusive. <laughs> Our female lead then gets a job at an ancestry DNA lab. Have a guess what they're called. No, seriously, have a guess. <laughs> Ooh, what up, fam? How do you do, fellow kids? I just love the fact how they let Liza work in this high security job where she has access to people's DNA. Don't think I won't report this. She, of course, messes the job up, sneezes into the vials, <laughs> and that leads to a rich white family mistaking her as a relative. The reason I found you is because I took this DNA test. You know, what up, fam? And as it turns out, we're related! This is the face of the clinically insane. <laughs> So, instead of white people bad this episode, uh, white people stupid? Here? This side of the family came over on the Mayflower, and mommy's side fought in the Civil War for the right side. And which side is the right side? <laughs> Liza, you're too funny. <gasps> oh my god. No, never mind. White people bad again. Liza, of course, uses this situation to manipulate the smooth brains to get a ton of free stuff. If you're having car bonus. trouble, I'll have a tow to our shop. Oh, that's nice of you, but I'm a little short on funds at the moment. Liza! Liza, we wouldn't charge you, your family. And you'll probably need a loaner car in the meantime, right? What? No, I could do that. That could definitely work. A relatable, 
protagonist, everyone. Also, I'm pretty convinced Harlow and Oliver are only in the show to perfectly encapsulate how any normal person would react to Liza Koshy's jokes. Can you believe they're just letting me use this car? I mean, the glove box is refrigerated. It's better than our refrigerator in the apartment. I went out and I bought butter just for the car. You guys want butter? Oh! I really do wish 90% of the jokes weren't random equals funny. But it's really not the case. The group were introduced to Liza's fake family. You can tell they're rich. Not because of the loaned car or the size of the house. But being able to spot the whiteness of the dad's teeth 40 kilometers away. America. Oh, look at you. Look at her, Cora. Oh, I'm looking, Dad. Oh. The dad actually looks like a stock image of a white businessman on Google Images. Now, I just got a quick question to ask you. Ask away. You know, now that I got a little bit of brown in my blood, I can say the N-word now, right? No, I, I, I know what the n-word is and no, you cannot. Are you sure? Why does Liza keep writing in white people that are racist? Like, I get it, white people do suck, but if this show gets a third season, I'm expecting a coronavirus stroke from one. Yeah, this place is alright, I guess. I mean, I'm only staying here because I got kicked out of my last place. You think my neighbors would be so stoked that I had a Migo show perform right on the front lawn? I mean, we pretty much put out the fire like right away, so it wasn't even that big of a deal. Also, the uh, the rich family's son kind of reminds me of another YouTuber. I wish I could get you the place I just listed, but I kind of already promised it to Ja Rule. What? Well, can I take a look at it? I mean, I guess you are like family now. I suppose I could fit you in. Suck it, Ja Rule, yeah. Come on, guys, don't don't kick Ja when he's down. Look, he's he's still recovering from Fire Festival. Oh, it's gonna be out of this world! Exploring the house, Liza finds a letter from the DNA company warning them that Liza is not part of the family. They also do this really overcomplicated skit that Liza is the bad guy because she she's half white. I have dealt with racism our entire lives. <laughs> and an opportunity like this just does not come along very often. You two playing the race card on me? Hello? Technically, you're half. Your white side owes us this. I don't even mind the race jokes, but if you're using them as a crutch for pretty much all of the comedy, then you know you have a problem. Like, seriously, it's it's even harder to find the funny this season than the first one. It's too fast! How could you even tell what's on? I can tell. That loaner car really suits you. I want you to keep it. Heated seats? Racism. Cooling seats? Racism. The option to set my butt to any temperature. Racism. Now Liza has a very difficult choice. Keep her comfortable life with near limitless wealth or single-handedly end racism. Liza obviously takes the more mature choice of ending racism. And probably because the budget would only allow renting the mansion for one episode. Liza, what are you talking about? It's a lie. And as this letter will tell you, we are not related. I'm white again. Mama's breaking out the good pill. Wait, we still have 10 minutes of runtime left. And the plot got resolved too early. Sure, let's have Liza's date be the rich son from the house. And he too has came to end racism. I mean, we've had some really great talks about race and my white privilege, and I can honestly say that I see how insensitive I really am. Wait, a side character having a redemption arc? We can't have that. He might transition from 1D to 2D. Quick, say, say he's into incest or something. Now that we're not related, we can go out. Wait, what do you mean we're not related? I mean, we're not related. Remember the big speech that I gave at your house? Oh yeah, I got bored and zoned out. Ah, oh, that's a bummer. The whole kissing cousins thing was what was kind of doing it for me. Gross. Well, maybe we could still pretend to be related? Okay. Yeah. yeah. We did it, guys. Budget saved and man still bad. Liza Koshy out here saving modern cinema. But first... Hey guys, have you heard of that new show? Oh? Which one? That one that has seven Emmy primetime nominations and has everyone talking about it. Yeah? Where can I watch that award-winning show that has the world conversing about it? You can't. Oh, it's not available in your country. And won't be until the year 2080. And now everyone will point and laugh at how you're not socially acceptable. Your wife will leave you, take the kids, and all you'll be left with is various straight-to-TV movies. Oh, woe is me. If only there was some way I could bypass content restrictions online. Now I'm in super hell forever. 
Don't be a simp like this man. Go to nordvpn.com forward slash parasynical for tons of cool benefits. Region unlocking. So now you can watch any show, no matter what the licensing. Finally, I can watch season 438 of The Walking Dead. It also keeps your website traffic anonymous, so not even God can see your search history. Get 70% of a three-year plan at nordvpn.com forward slash parasynical, including a whole month free. That's such a good deal. I'm going to donate the money I've saved to that cute woman on Twitch who's going to be my future wife. You even get a cool map. Look, Russia has nine trees and Africa has none. Come on, guys. Step up your game. Use code parasynical. Use it now. Use it now. Use it now. Add over. I can say the N-word now, right? Now, episode three is all about online ads. You know, they're, they're kind of a double-edged sword. As much as I despise ads, I need them to make a living. So please turn off ad block. Thanks, guys. The, op <laughs> the opening shows Liza leaving a nice comment on someone's artwork in a sea of negative ones. I'm gonna write something nice. Mm. Hey, I love Timothy Chalamet, and this looks just like him. This scene has pretty much nothing to do with the rest of the episode and only highlights how much of a good-natured person Liza is. Take my Reddit gold, Liza. Take it all, please. Maybe one day you can have my platinum. Also, Harlow and Oliver are using this free face filter app that has ads on it, and this could have been a funny skit. I mean, imagine all the pop-ups that could have came up. You guys have no idea what we're doing. Liza later has a smoke detector installed by a creepy old guy that may or may not have installed a camera inside to spy on her. Okay, now, uh, the red light, you know, sometimes flashing on the smoke detector. That just means it's working. Not that there's a camera in there. This is never brought up again and feels really out of place in the rest of the episode, but, you know, I guess there's a quota to fill somewhere. Back into the main plot. <laughs> Lies is also using this free app, and this has led to her face being used for multiple ads without her consent. She meets a hacker who tells her that she has to go into hiding away from the internet if she wants the exposure to stop. But can you restore my contacts? You don't need to reach anyone, and no one needs to reach you. Go dark. Hell, if I could destroy the memory of us meeting right now, I would. Just like how everyone forgot that Kendall Jenner solved racism with a Pepsi. All right, you know what? That, that was a good one. Can't believe I complimented Eliza Koshi joke. Wow, that was really nice, Pepsi man. Anyway, time to beat the protesters. <laughs> Liza goes on a boycott for online ads, but then realizes she's missing out on pretty much every social interaction. Ordering food and watching movie trailers are out of the question. Bro, what the fuck is this supposed to be? Anybody brings me this as a gift? I'm literally telling you to return this. You know the boomer memes that are like, phone bad? The episode turns that into everyone walking around on their phones like zombies. Until Liza meets a very special cameo. <laughs> Josh Peck. Hysterical! Josh, of course from Drake and Josh fame, and that one film where he plays a fat kid that swears a lot. He now has his own YouTube channel and frequently collabs with Jimmy Fallon's son. To be fair though, I gotta give respect to his weight loss. I too was once a... a heckin' chunker. Oh, why do I say that? Hillary Clit. I'm voting for Hillary Clit. <laughs> We're starting a real movement. I mean, the internet is so much more dangerous than people realize. Yeah, you don't have to tell me. Liza wants in on Josh's no tech group and has to sign an NDA to join. Totally. Hey, I get it. Privacy is no joke. You can already tell where this is going. You know, with, with the face app, she signed a contract. She does want, yeah, you get it, all right? Liza, this is Eli and Roger, Thomas, and this is Andrew. Going inside, it's pretty much an Amish community. No technology means living in the 1800s, apparently. You always walk around. <laughs> We were all drawn to each other through a mutual distrust of technology. Specifically, the rise of the internet. I made one slightly racist joke on Twitter six years ago and never deleted it. Now I can't get a job anywhere. I feel in any other show, that would have been a joke. But because so many jokes Liza makes are white people bad, I'm not sure whether she's saying this is a comment on cancel culture or people getting what they deserve. Oh yeah, and remember that contract she signed? It's not that great. We will be safe downstairs in a fully stocked bunker where we will wait out the apocalypse till we can rebuild the human race with Liza as the mother of all our children. Yes! Let's go! Yes! <laughs> what? 
It's basically a complete ripoff of season one, where she goes to that political event only to find out she got baited into supporting everything against her beliefs for bad man. I want you to imagine a time when life was about working with your hands. When you wanted to hear a song, you simply dropped a needle on a phonograph. So in conclusion, man bad again, but this time, Signed on paper. Thomas still has a red tube account. Excuse me, that is YouTube red and I use it to watch Cobra Kai. <laughs> Eli stays up all night watching Japanese newscast report. I don't understand. How you think? The Amazon would help my own. They read the news! Published in Japanese. Yours. Jelly Bean. He's enough. That's about enough. I got some jelly beans. Episode 4 starts off with Liza dying. I. <laughs> Only joking guys, Liza and her bank account are just fine. She gets a task at job to work at a place called Prospector Gym, and Liza can't go five seconds without making a race-related joke again. You think he's aware that the name is a little problematic? You know, the gold rush was basically a Native American genocide. <laughs> Sorry. That woman is my mental state trying to watch this show. You also have this guy that looks like Jimmy Kimmel, who takes Liza's donut and spits it out anyway. <laughs> Later on, the group is doing a pub quiz and cheers to the winning round. Then a guy barges into them, making them spill their drink, and Liza apologizes. Sorry. They then tried to twist this as like a, a societal norm that women apologize for everything, even when they're not in the wrong. Why the hell did you apologize to him, Liza? I don't know, it's just being polite, I guess. No, that's not polite. You just said I'm sorry after he knocked into us. That's a really bad habit, Liza, and women do that all the time. It's a pointless bit trying to weakly shoehorn in a message of female empowerment. There's definitely inequality between men and women, but I've been sitting down at bars, and I still apologize if someone barges into me. Partly because that's what my brain does on autopilot, and secondly because I'm a coward. Half the time, women apologize for things that they didn't even do wrong. Men never do that. Oh, who put that there? Wait, so you're telling me, man, bad? What? Sorry, I just, I just need a moment. Truly thought-provoking content. Can I get a bowl of that chili? Thank God this wasn't locked beyond a paywall like HBO. Liza goes to bed and wishes that she could stop apologizing just for one day. 1990. Sparks fly out of her plug adapter and she wakes up, losing the ability to say sorry. Liza, did you finish the almond milk? Oh, I'm so s Oliver, I'm really s what? So clearly, guys, she's died in a house fire and is living out her worst nightmares in purgatory. Living in LA and not being able to say sorry. Look, uh, uh, all right, all right, come on, guys. Look, no, no, no one wants to live in LA. There's just connections to be made. She finds out pretty quickly that she's living in a dream where she can't apologize. They could have put a cool twist on this. Like in Mr. Robot, they had this one episode where they had like a fake set to purposely emulate an old TV show. But instead they have the same sets, same setup, just Liza can't say the S word anymore. Which leads to hilarious inconveniences. My grandmother died. Oh, oh I'm so stoked. You're stoked? Yeah. Oh, it's classic George, am I right? Something I've noticed with Liza, she doesn't know how to act with anything apart from her mouth. She kind of reminds me of Rey from the first Star Wars film she appeared in, like, you know, staring blankly, doing big mouth open thing. It's not proper acting. I bypassed the compressor. <coughs> if you look at Liza's eyes when she's being overdramatic, they're pretty much doing nothing apart from a wide-eyed glance like she's staring into the void. This is also coming from someone with no acting experience. So, you know, it's coming from a good place. The aliens are coming! We've been compromised! Liza gets called to the manager's office for a lack of apologies. He, of course, loves her new demeanor, never taking no as an answer. He basically gives her control over the entire company, giving him options to run with, including changing their stock and removing his ponytail. Oh, there's just one more thing I want to get your honest opinion on. What do you think about my ponytail? Oh, I'm so... Done, do you think that looks good? I'm I'm so su surprised nobody has cut it off already. <laughs> I knew it. But you were the first person with the balls to tell Degenerates like you belong on a cross. But Liza starts to notice some cracks when the manager takes his mistakes out on his secretary. Uh just to let you know Rachel Ray's still on the phone. What the hell? Why did you tell me? 
I'm so sorry. There goes our Rachel Raisin Brand cereal and our Rachel Ray Fried Beans. Can you stop screwing everything up and get her back? Sorry. Liza tries to tell him how it's his fault, but can't because she can't say the S word. I'm saying you should probably say you're super. By the way, here's multiple examples of what she should have said without saying the S word to him. She's also fallen out with her friends because she couldn't make the pub quiz. Like, I, I, I don't really understand how this is Liza's fault. Oh, hi, Liza. Remember us? Your roommates, your teammates, the Destiny's Child to your Beyonce. Guys, we know um, you're too important for us now. Her getting more work and the others getting angry because she doesn't have time just seems really jealous and spiteful. Like, guys, I, I hate to say this for once, but I don't think Liza's in the wrong. <laughs> With her friendship ruined from jealous friends and possible job security for the foreseeable future, this is a nightmare Liza needs to wake up from. And the next day, she can apologize again. Sorry. This leads to her to just be a complete brainlet on purpose, only to apologize after. Sorry. Wait, so I can do bad thing, but if I apologize, it's okay? Right, guys, I'm off to commit arson. If I apologize in the court, I'll be fine. The moral of the story this episode, women have power. Liza, you really should apologize to the team for wasting their time like this. No. You're fired! <laughs> Episode 5 opens with Liza on a date, meeting a guy that seems perfect and a high achiever. He slurps on his coffee, so Liza breaks up with him instantly. Introduce us sooner. <laughs> It's ironic how someone who writes people as one-dimensional characters wrote herself to cut off from people who have a slight fault. Wait, could this be self-awareness? Oliver tries to help Liza out by telling her to lower her standards. What? You always do this, Liza. You meet some amazing guy and you find a tiny little flaw and then you blow the whole thing up. I do not. An actually funny bit, honestly. Again, like, Oliver is really the only redeeming person in this show. If he was the central character instead of Liza, I'd probably enjoy this show, but unfortunately, he doesn't have a YouTube channel with 17 million subscribers. Later on, Liza starts working a tasket job at a fairground and meets a guy who's a possible date. They have great chemistry, and he's the only person in the entire series to ever laugh at a joke she's made. I mean, we could probably take him if we gang up. He'd look potentially lethal. I don't want to brag or anything, but I did just get my black belt last year. Mm. Not for karate, just a really nice black belt for me, you know? <laughs> He's an ad marketer and apparently has no social media, which gives Oliver and Harlow red flags. And he has a job. He's a partner at an ad agency. They made that Super Bowl commercial, the one that made me cry. <gasps> the one with the hot wings. Oh, I wonder if he designed the Super Bowl ad Rice Gun was in. Also, I find it ironic that apparently someone who isn't on social media is inherently a bad person. I mean, in the last episode, Liza's writers were trying to convey that people who spend all their time on social media were just drones. Also now, Oliver has a boyfriend who's basically the embodiment of what the internet thinks a Redditor acts like in real life. Ooh, smoking! At her date's house, Liza goes through his belongings to find a bunch of poorly photoshopped images of him. I thought this would be part of the plot, but every superimposed picture before this has been trash as well, so it's probably just production quality. Just before concluding her investigation, Liza finds a pair of women's heels in the wardrobe. I thought by the end of the episode we'd find out he's into cross-dressing, but Oliver states it too early, so that can't be the case. Okay, you don't know it's another woman. Maybe he likes wearing women's shoes. Did you think of that? And would that really be such a bad thing? It is 2019. Maybe you should be a little more progressive, Liza. I am very progressive. Oh, we know, Liza. We know. Later on, she takes up stalking her date, which gets her into more trouble. Damn it! Hey, you can't just leave that thing in the middle of the street. You goddamn millennials, you're turning this whole city into your own personal skate park! To be fair, you know, at least she didn't make it a race thing. Liza then sees her date with another woman, and despite him giving no public affection to her, and it could just be work-related, is convinced he's two-timing her. Out of spite, Liza goes back to the fairground to find him and publicly humiliate him, only for it to totally backfire. Another woman? I saw you with her, Hendrix. I saw you both coming out of the hotel. That woman you saw me with is my sister. It was her birthday. She's a manager at the hotel when I met her there for lunch. You know, we took that selfie together to send to our mom. Oh, that's, that's really sweet. They also share a kiss where they only bite each other's bottom lip. I mean, 
Gotta keep it PG-13, I guess. Of course, this relationship can't last because they'd actually have to rewrite him into the show. So we find out last minute, the guy is a total psycho. I want the f giraffe. I f tossed that on the peg and then I won the f giraffe. Giraffe, thank you, sir. The giraffe is mine. I will take this giraffe. No, 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 no. Get your f hands off. Yeah, that's what I think you're a giraffe. Okay, that's what I think you're a giraffe. I'll tell their heads off all these motherfuckers. This is the same way I got kicked off Twitter. Yep, dude, I, I feel you. I too have a permanent Twitter ban. Also, Harlow's date is a douche, and Oliver gets sick of his boyfriend's impersonations. How about Gamergate? <laughs> so all in all, a completely pointless episode that went nowhere. Truly Oscar-worthy content. <laughs> episode six opens up with Liza having tooth pain, saying that she needs task it points to get insurance for her to see a dentist. Imagine living in a country where healthcare wasn't free. I mean, I need to use my task it insurance, but I don't have enough points. Also, remember what was said in the first episode? Okay, there's no status of any kind now. It's a goddamn free for all. So now, task it is worth something. <laughs> Taking up her task it job, Liza goes to her house and then bumps into an old friend. <laughs> It's me, Katie. I knew I recognized you. We did Tasket training together. We did? Yeah. Yeah, I imagine Tasket training is right next door to the place where you assemble iPhones. I want to weed out anything that doesn't scream boss, you know? Like these jeans. I mean, I was going to put stuff on consignment, but I think we'll just donate. $500 for a pair of jeans? Firstly, who keeps the tag on their jeans, like, four years after you've bought them? And secondly, Liza, honey, look, I know it's a character you're playing that shares the same first name as you, but don't act like $500 is a lot. We've all seen your net worth, we know the brand deals you get. It, it didn't work with Shane Dawson, and it's not gonna work here. You have Gucci slides? Maybe you should try getting a job. I think it's kind of ironic that there's a girl in the show who's rich and successful, and has many famous contacts, and it's not Liza. Is Liza Koshi projecting herself into the show? I mean, to to be fair, she was with Will Smith the other week. I got a show called yeah. Liza On Demand. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Actually, you know ah. Later on, Liza and her posse start doing a stage play inside the apartment. Not really sure why, but at least the boomer gets another chance to shine. Look, I saw Vice, okay? I can do three different kinds of heart attacks. I can give you the- Me, homo vloggers. What the? My name is Jeff. Or the- uh, uh. Yes, yes, and yes! There's a guy playing on the piano as well. I'm sure it's gonna get content ID'd, so I'm just gonna sum up the whole scene with penis music. <laughs> also, one thing to mention, the cinematography for this episode is very different. Instead of mostly still frames like the rest of the series, it has a handheld camera, much like other sitcoms like Modern Family, and I... I actually kind of like it. I think it's a really good addition and makes scenes feel a lot more organic instead of just waiting for Liza to make a funny reference to something. I have no idea why they filmed the entire show with this static angle. It, it makes everything feel so robotic and lifeless. <laughs> Going back to Liza's rich friend's house, she's agreeing to see the live stage play. But what's this? I'll enhance that. Only a basic AirPod? Or maybe AirPod 2 at best? I'm sorry, but if you don't have the AirPods Pro, you're a certified peasant. Before the show, Oliver and Liza have an argument about Vision, and Liza kicks Oliver out of the casting, forcing her to set up an impromptu cast to take his role. And this is actually a really funny concept. You auditioning for the role of Oliver too? Auditioning? I am Oliver. Oh, that's good. Gotta fully commit right away. I'm gonna try that. I am Oliver. Again, like, what? why does Oliver not have his own show? I swear, the only funny things generate from him. The next scene, we have a montage of auditions that just remind me of really bad acting on early YouTube. Honey, you've got a big storm coming. Someone finally gets the role of Oliver and starts copying everything Oliver does. Again, this is pretty funny. Like, the concept isn't original, but I vibe with Oliver getting a bigger role. I was cast in the role of Oliver. The show's this weekend, so I want to make sure I did as much research as possible. Could you tell me about a traumatic childhood experience that I can draw from? I, I don't have the... I, mm. I actually looked up who wrote and directed this episode, and these people have not worked on a single episode prior. It really shows how something can go from terrible to watchable if you change up who's working behind the scenes. Liza later apologizes to Oliver for kicking him off the acting team. He apparently predicted it and came in costume to outshine everyone. 10 out of 10 character development. Flashback. Also, that rich girl from earlier, she's a fraudster and gets arrested because no one can be more powerful than Liza Koshi. Why are you arresting her? Multiple counts of fraud. Fraud? She misled investors with false information. Fake accounts, fake followers. 
hold on a minute. Did we finish an entire episode of Liza on Demand and man wasn't bad? Heaven to be praised. The, the writers have had actual character development. The next episode is super, super different. It's an archive pilot episode that was meant to be streamed on an unspecified network. My theory, it'd be on AMC, replacing Better Call Saul and The Walking Dead. That pilot has been under lock and key until now. And we would love to share it with you. This episode has a more sitcom feel, including a live studio audience reacting. Kind of like the wedding from Shrek. He's not your true love. What do you know about true love? Well, I... <laughs> the ogre has... Sim. It comes across as really jarring because no other episode is filmed like this. Characters take long pauses so the audience can laugh. Like, th there's videos on YouTube of sitcoms that have the laughter track removed. And it becomes really noticeable how long the characters' breaks are between sentences to give the audience time to react. <sighs> Pizza's on the way. I told you we wouldn't have to get up. What if we have to pee? Cancel the sodas. The only difference now, really, is that people are actually employed just to laugh at Liza's jokes. Oh, oh, oh. You guys look amazing. What is the occasion? She forgot. No, no, I didn't forget about Twin Day. <laughs> They also have this really weird intro that just uses, like, B-roll from previous episodes. Like, none of this was filmed just for the episode, so it feels even more phoned in. She'll always understand she's Liza on demand. I genuinely thought they were doing a Mr. Robot bit and, like, you know, halfway through Liza would wake up and it'd all be a dream, but no. Nope. But don't worry, I'm as not dead as I've ever been. Were you able to pick up the new pearls for Miss Eva? Yes, I did, and they are right here. <gasps> oh. Why did everyone chuckle? Like, <laughs> she opened a box. Like, where is the comedy? Yeah, the audience okay. is tripping out on fentanyl. No, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Liza has a job and meets a woman who's scared of leaving her home, and to push her out of her comfort zone, steals her property and forces her to come out of the house to get it back. There you go. Liza takes her into the apartment and sets up shop, including bringing all of her dolls, despite just, being locked um, out of her house. <clears throat> Where are your keys? You know, you know whatever. I'm, I'm not educated enough to question the Liza Koshy Lord. The woman starts to take over the group's lives, looking more and more like Teresa from Fable. Did it, boys. Video game reference that wasn't Dark Souls. Give me some Reddit gold. They take her to a doll store under the promise that if she gets a particular doll, she'll go back to her own apartment. But unfortunately, they're stopped by a guy who crashes into them because he has the flu. Oh! Oh, oh, I knew it! Six! Oh, uh, I'm so sorry. Are you okay? No. Oh, God. No, but not because of the car. It's, it's because I think I have the flu and I'm trying to get to the doctor before they close, you know, because I have a terrible cough. <laughs> <laughs> in a fever. Did Liza Koshy predict the coronavirus? Weak my ass. Liza goes home, an AC unit nearly falls on her. Oh, oh my god! Only for a potted plant to... Alright, all right, you know what? Just stop. Look, I, I get comedy is subjective, but you, you can't just have random things happening every five seconds and classify that as entertainment. There's no structural flow here. Gypsy woman has dolls, man with flu, Liza hit on head. I, I feel like I'm getting ADD just watching this episode. The less I can play and the quicker it'll be over. Well, what happens at the end? Yep, yeah, the, the woman gets the doll and she moves out at the end. Great. Also, th there's some guy doing a, a parasynical purple hat cameo. Yeah, I really gotta, uh, I really gotta finish that series. <laughs> Thankfully, episode 8 returns to normal with a laughter track free format. Like, I, I can't believe I've reached the point where I'm thanking Liza Koshy for returning the show to normal. I think this show has actually turned me into a sleeper agent. What you do is subscribe to Liza Koshy now. Excuse me. The episode begins with Oliver and Harlow minimizing their wardrobe. You know that thing people do when they have too much spare time on their hands? It's basically removing everything in your possession that isn't bare essentials. Liza, you're looking at this all wrong. Minimizing is great. Holding onto objects from your past only stops you from moving forward. Yeah, just tell Pokemon YouTubers to get rid of their card collection. I'm sure that'll go down well. I haven't seen my wife in two months. She has probably left me for another man with two functioning legs. Pokemon cards are all I have. 
Please leave me alone. Liza does a tasket job helping a guy called Scott move his furniture, and she discovers that he played a character in a childhood TV show, starring a rabbit and a bear called... Rabbit... and Bear. Again, the, the, the originality is just awe-inspiring. This causes Liza to be super invested, and her invested voice is even more annoying than her regular voice. Look! It's Rabbit and Bear! Oh, remember that episode where Rabbit was afraid of the dark, so Bear gave him a little tiny bear to hug when he went to sleep? Oh, come on! Back at home, Oliver and Harlow are still minimalizing, and to be fair, they're actually turning it into a pretty funny bit. I can hold my drink while I watch TV. Do I really need to sit while I eat? Isn't food better standing? Well, I don't really need this. <laughs> I mean, I know what I look like. Then Liza comes back and hijacks the actually funny concept with her A story. The guy whose garage I've been minimizing? He is the creator and star of Magic Meadows. <laughs> The famous local children's TV show that aired from 1995 to 2002? You guys have never seen Magic Meadows? Get the frap out! Oh god, I, I thought she was just gonna swear there, like my, my Christian viewers would've unsubscribed. Back in the B story, Oliver and Harlow's minimizing is getting worse, to the point where Oliver pours himself a coffee, they CGI'd in the steam from the mug. It's nice to know the budget is going where it's really needed. In Liza's story, she reaches out to Scott's friend, who he used to do the children's show with. Scott's crazy, and I'm done with crazy. I installed a home theater for Little Wayne. I think it's pronounced Lil. You know what? You're crazy too. I'm not sure why, but Scott and his old partner both remind me pretty heavily of Stephen Merchant. They both emulate the same quirky mannerisms he had in The Office and in Portal 2. That's what I thought. Please leave. Unless you want to talk about an easy low interest payment plan. No forgetting. Get out! Stand right here, stand. Where do you go? Come back, come back! No, seriously, <laughs> come back, please, come back. Will you please light up all that stuff like a doob at a fish concert? Because I don't want to look at it again. I do, however, want to smoke a doob right now. Thank you for the suggestion. I was a big, lanky, goggle-eyed freak. All right, calm down, mate. There's no need to get no, offensive. No, no, I was doing enjoying the... Call you fatty soon as right, I saw no, you. Was... Liza, being the honest, hard-working woman she is, baits both of the kids' show hosts to come to the house so they inevitably have to confront each other. Your wiring looks sound enough. Well, if it isn't Puppeteer Magazine's Betrayer of the Year. Look, I know you have a problem with Scott being a micromanager, and I know you have problems with Jeremy not pulling his own weight. Is, Is that, that what he said? said? The rest of the episode just devolves into people using puppets and making funny voices. Actually, five-year-olds are capable of grasping some pretty sophisticated concepts, Bear. You have a single fact to back that up. Like, the good news is, Liza finally understands her subscriber's age. This is a pivotal moment. Like, I'm not even joking. I I'm scrubbing through this episode, and the rest of it is just puppets. With the amount of innuendos this show has, you think they'd put, like, a, a dark twist on the kids' show, but no, it it's just it's just the Muppets. Yeah. Oh, no! No, never mind. They do have a dark twist. Near the end, they've got like a remake of the puppet show with J.J. Abrams, and it's starring Will Smith and Emma Stone, where they just get it on. Oh, oh, right. oh, major departure. This is not appropriate metal behavior, not at all. I want to see. No. I swear, Liza Koshy's writing team is just. Sex funny, famous name, repeat. The problem I have with this show is that Liza's Tasket job has taken a major backseat, and without it, the series feels super lost and confused. The Tasket concept wasn't original, but at least it forced Liza into uncomfortable situations and created a funny dynamic. And you know, with her getting the elite status, there was actually an end game, like a point to continue watching the series. Now all we have is just grown men with puppets and a uh, <laughs> man with a cough. <laughs> Now, the final two episodes do change the game a little bit, mostly because it's one episode that's split into two parts. Pretty surprised that they're connecting. I mean, the only real continuity we've had so far is the boomer guy who seems to play all the side character roles. The episode begins with Liza performing a usual comedy routine, being loud and unfunny, pulling off the worst Australian accent of all time. Good day, mate. Oh, you like more Australian clipsticks? Afterwards, the group open up a time capsule, and this could have actually been a really good gag. They could have called back to previous episodes, like, you know, the, the cupcake in from the first episode, or the jigsaw piece that Liza lost. But instead, they... <laughs> they again use it just to put out there that man bad. These are my favorite snack. This cookie's dipped in icing. <laughs> oh, this hasn't aged very well. Well, considering what men are up to these days, she can get biking snacks. So the theme around this two-parter is New Year's, as Liza does odd jobs organizing other people's events, 
Uh, a pretty interesting concept. I'm just wondering how they're going to make it unfunny. In the evening, the group sneak into a party they weren't invited to because Liza has a task at job to read a kid a bedtime story. Hi, I'm here to read you a bedtime story. Hi, I'm Liza. And how old are you? 13. Why are you screaming? If you guys don't recognize this kid, he actually made a cameo in the very first episode where Liza was doing an Uber job. You're getting one star. You think they'd reference this and have some kind of callback with the kid, but apparently this child is meant to be someone Liza has never met before and the encounter is never mentioned. Also, he tries to kiss her because all men are terrible. Whoa! Meanwhile, Oliver gets a tarot card reading and finds out that the night is gonna end horribly. There's going to be an explosion, a violent explosion at tonight's party. An explosion? <sighs> Oliver is so shocked, his reaction makes the entire set shake. Harlow, now on her own, starts hitting on all the men for a midnight kiss, but keeps being cooked until she eventually stumbles on Jason Nash? Drink and Josh! If you don't know who he is, he frequents David Dobrik's vlogs a lot and lives rent-free in Trisha Paytas' brain. Oh my god, there's little ants all by my butt. Oh my god. He comes across as a creep and Harlow leaves him and th that's it. He actually does not appear again in the rest of the episode. That was like, that was like a 14 second cameo. Liza, exploring the rest of the party, finds an actual celebrity. Is that Rachel Lee Cook? Hey, that is her. My wife absolutely loves her. Who's that? Uh, oh, uh, okay. And ironically, I have no idea who this is. I knew Jason and Josh when they made their cameos, but uh, I got nothing here. Apparently she has 100k followers on Twitter. The guy pretending to be me has more followers than her. Number three, I don't like you. Also, the party was meant to have a lead singer, but they bailed. Thankfully, Liza Koshi is here to save the day with her amazing singing ability. Cruising to that Miami beat. And the streamy goes to Liza Koshi! Liza eventually completes the task it and can finally enjoy her own New Year's. But plot twist, the car has been stolen. Where's your car? Thank goodness all these episodes are available now. I'd surely go insane having to wait a week to find out what happened to the car. The final episode begins with a recap of the previous episode. Kind of pointless because all that happened was a bunch of plot threads that didn't go anywhere and Liza's car being stolen. The semi-famous woman from the previous episode comes to help and she does this CSI bit the entire episode that just feels really out of place. Have you forgotten that I spent six years as the star of CSI Des Moines? All I do is figure out the impossible. That trash can's covered in ejaculate. Don't touch anything, this room is covered in ejaculate. I get it, popular TV show reference, but without any kind of tonal change or real reason to put it in, it, it comes across like a Family Guy cutaway gag. Liza and Rachel go to the parking lot where a car has been towed and try to convince the manager to release the car without paying any fees. And you do not want to make Patel angry. I said you don't want to make Patel angry. Well, it's too late. I'm angry. Oh yeah, I am. About lots of things. That's why they call me pissed off Patel. All right, shut it down. Shut it down. Uncensored swear word. Videos are safety hazard, people. Not advertiser friendly. And I know what I'm doing! Okay, okay, Patel. I actually thought she was going to smash a window then. But I remembered the CGI B and the CGI steam from the coffee mug. The budget is now on shambles. In the B story, Harlow and Oliver are trying to enjoy a New Year's party. Harlow bumps into a guy with a, a microwave for a head. Is Liza Koshi trying to mock the Pyrocynical channel? But plot twist, it's Mark Wahlberg from season one. An actual callback. I'm amazed the writing team even remember anything five seconds after they wrote it down. For those who don't remember, this guy was Harlow's ex-boyfriend who made a cameo in the first season. Not a great character, but at least I can say now that the show had some kind of callback. Liza finally gets her car back and she drives the drunk guy home from the previous episode. He massively overpays her, giving her well over $500. Liza keeps the money and drops him off at the wrong place. Hey, this is in my house. Yeah, she's, she's really up there with Count Frollo right about now. Liza follows and manages to get into the club, but not without having a deep philosophical debate with the staff. Going to this party just to live out some childish idea of fun is a terrible idea. 
It's definitely not $250. And you did it anyway. All right. Now, Liza does pretty much the only redeemable thing in the entire show. She ditches the club and goes back to the house she had the tasket job in and tips the girl there with the drunk guy money. I mean, even though it's not really her money, I, I guess there was a good deed there. 1,400 points to me. One to Liza. The countdown to midnight starts. Harlow goes to kiss Mark Wahlberg, only to bail out last second. <laughs> Microwave man has been cooked. Please smash like so we can finally get a GF. Also, the show steals a note from Logan Paul's airplane mode and throws in a... a, a funny puke joke. <laughs> the show finally concludes with the group together, back where they started, achieving pretty much nothing apart from having more self-worth as people. What a wholesome ending. Yeah, season two just sucks. And the show sucked. Season 1 was mediocre at best, but this was just painfully unfunny. Maybe it's unfair because we already know the format, you know, following seasons and sequels always have to outdo the previous content, but here it just falls flat. I think the biggest thing that hurt this show was removing the main focus on Tasket. I mean, Liza has no real end goal in the series now. At least season one had a positive conclusion. This just had nothing. I'm a materialistic person. If there's no visible change by the end of the show, then show bad. I'm a critic, by the way. I hate to say it, but in retrospect, the first season was actually pretty entertaining, you know, with the doppelgangers and the weird cult-like funeral. This season is mostly just failed dates and minor inconveniences. Hopefully in season three, Liza takes me on as a lead writer, so I can fix the show by making every character Liza Koshy. <laughs>